Hello, everyone. This is Shane Lynn at MacArthur Museum of Arkansas Military History, and I have a very special guest with me today, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hugh Mills. For those who don't know him, he's one of uh, the most decorated pilots from the Vietnam War. He's a native of Hot Springs. Uh, he commanded the Aerial Scout Platoon, uh, the outcasts of D Troop. Uh, he developed many of the Aerial Scouts tactics. Um, he also later flew Cobras. He's the author of Low Level Hell, a scout pilot in the Big, Big Red One. Uh, he flew more than 3,300 uh, combat hours. He retired in 1993 as, with uh, 26 years of service as an aviator. Uh, he has many decorations and honors. I'll just mention a few. Three Silver Stars, the Legion of Merit, six Distinguished flying crosses, three bronze stars, and three purple hearts. He's also a great friend of the museum. If you've been to our museum, you in our Vietnam gallery, you will see an exhibit uh, containing some of his uh, items from when he flew in Vietnam, his uniform, his helmet, uh, some photographs. So with that, I would just like to say, Colonel Mills, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your service. And we're glad to have you with us today. Well, Shane, thanks. Thanks a bunch. It's, uh, it's good to come home on occasion, even though it may be virtual. Right. Well, we're, we're certainly glad that you are doing well during this pandemic and uh, that you could be with, here with us. Now, I mentioned earlier, you grew up in Hot Springs, native of Hot Springs, and graduated from Hot Springs High School. What was that like growing up? in Arkansas during that time? Well, I, I did, and I, and I would be remiss if I didn't say in advance, I actually moved from Monticello. Uh, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, April of 48. My dad was a teacher uh, and principal at Monticello High School, and we went to my grandmother's house uh, so that she could help with, uh, with the first birth of the family. I'm the oldest of four. And uh, so lived in, uh, in Monticello uh, until 58. We moved to Hot Springs in 59. Um, and I attended from sixth grade through high school uh, in Hot Springs. Uh, loved, loved Hot Springs uh, in all the years of roaming around the world with the military. Uh, I consider Hot Springs home. Uh, my mother is still living. She's uh, in uh, Fayetteville. I've got two brothers in Fayetteville, a sister in Forest City, um, but Hot Springs is is home to me, and and that's where uh, my thoughts gravitate to when I when I think of uh, the very solid past. All right. Well, you graduated in '66, and then is it from then when you went into the service in '67, or how did how did you get in get involved with the service? And then more importantly, if I remember correctly, you started off in the paratroopers, but then gravitated toward flying. How did that come about? Well, uh, it's it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a uh, short story. I I went to Arkansas Tech for one semester out of uh, Hot Springs, uh, excelled in ROTC and the Sport Parachute Club, uh, and, and not so much anything else. Uh, so that was kind of a wake up call to me that my interests lay uh, in the military, and uh, and I loved uh, sport parachute jumping. And uh, so I went down, I convinced my dad uh, with, with a great deal of effort that, that I just probably wasn't ready for college at that point in time. And uh, I enlisted in the Army in February of 67 as an airborne infantryman. Um, went into the Army, completed basic training at Fort Polk, uh, advanced infantry training at uh, Fort Lewis, and then was selected for OCS. Um, Came very close to not accepting it because they wanted me to go to armor OCS and not infantry OCS, which was uh, uh, kind of my orientation at that point in time. Uh, but with a swift kick uh, in a strategic part of my body from my father, I accepted OCS, uh, attended armor OCS at Fort Knox. And while I was there, a, a notice came out that they were trying to get uh, aviators uh, into the theater in Vietnam. And if you were interested, you could go and, and uh, take a test. So I took the flight aptitude test 
and then the only other qualification uh, to, for consideration anyway was you had to go down to uh, fly in an army aircraft and, uh, and, and be able to tolerate that. Um, I, I went down and flew a, a, a short ride with a pilot at Fort Knox at Godman Army Airfield. And it was in an OH-6, a brand new aircraft in the inventory the, in, in 1967, 68. Um, and that's the aircraft I flew in for about an hour and he didn't scare me and he didn't make me sick. So I qualified. Uh, and that's how I got to flight school. I Fort Walters in uh, April of 68 uh, into Fort Rucker. Uh, in uh, October of, uh, of 68. And then I graduated from flight school um, and then headed to, uh, to Vietnam on 1 January, 1969. And you, you arrived there and you, you said you flew the OH-6s. Could you tell our viewers a little bit about that aircraft and particularly what its mission was? The OH-6 was the winner of a U.S. Army um, fly-off competition for an aerial scout aircraft uh, that uh, basically featured uh, entries from Bell helicopter, uh, from uh, Hiller helicopter, and from Hughes helicopter, a, a relatively new company at the time. Uh, the OH-6 won that fly-off, setting 23 world records for everything from speed over a closed course to altitude. But essentially, the OH-6 was a four-place jet turbine helicopter with a semi-rigid rotor head and uh, was designed specifically for aerial scouting. It replaced the, uh, uh, the Hiller uh, H-23, which I flew in flight school as a primary trainer, and also the Bell uh, OH-13, which was operating in Vietnam at the time as a scout aircraft. Both of those aircraft had reciprocating engines, Lycoming uh, gas uh, engines, uh, and the OH-6 was the Army's first scout aircraft with a turbine engine. Extremely fast, extremely maneuverable. Uh, it would outturn uh, anything in the inventory at the time, um, and it was extremely uh, survivable. It was it was designed around a truss A frame which was designed to allow the aircraft to crash and to shed its external components like uh, wings, tail, or correction, uh, tail, uh, uh, rotors, and, and landing gear. And it rolled itself up into a ball. Uh, and usually the guys went crawling out of it uh, with, with little or no damage. So very survivable. It was the 59 MGA of the United States Army at the time. And, but it was, it, it was used for observation and scouting, as you said, but uh, it, it lacked something, didn't it, that most uh, aircraft had in the sense of weapons. It was an unarmed uh, that, 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 that's, that's, correct. that's correct. The aircraft uh, has flown in different configurations by different units, but Essentially, the pilot flew in the right seat. They would often fly a, a, an additional observer in the left seat in the front. And then normally there was a door gunner in the right rear armed with an M60 machine gun. Uh, that was a defensive weapon. It was not an offensive weapon. And uh, uh, the aircraft came into country with gun kits assigned to each airframe, the XM27E1 minigun. Uh, which was a 1500 round uh, uh, M134 minigun, same gun that's in the nose of a Cobra. Uh, but it, it uh, stuck out of the aircraft on the left-hand side. And most units initially didn't use them because they believed that the mission of the scout ship was to observe and report and not to get tied up with the, uh, the enemy, uh, negating the use, if you will, of the Cobra. Um, you, uh, you sort of changed that, didn't you? Well, I didn't, I didn't like the notion of every time I ran into a, a, an enemy force and noted their position and engaged them with the door gun, I always had to come to altitude and let the, let the Cobra work. And my essential thought at the time was so long as the scout did not get himself uh, significantly engaged, decisively engaged with the enemy, 
to where he couldn't break contact that uh, I'd rather take the fight to them than let them shoot at me and make me go up. So I mounted many guns on my aircraft and uh, we began to take that fight to the enemy. And, and surprisingly, the number of times that uh, enemy troops would fire at us dropped because they knew what was about to happen uh, over over a course of time. And there was a, a certain time, though, you could recount the story how a, a Cobra pilot a helicopter was very happy that you were armed. Yes, uh, th there was a particular time and first time in our unit, and it, it, it was not planned, it just happened. Um, I had found a bunker complex up near the trapezoid uh, on the uh, Song Bay River and the, um, as I was coming to altitude, the Cobra went in to do a, a strike and was fired upon. And as I looked down to my right, I could see the guy with the machine gun shooting at the Cobra. So I just called a hard break and I was attacking from, uh, from a different angle. And, and it's the first time in our unit that a scout ever covered a Cobra on a gun run. Uh, I, I, I caught a lot of flack from the Cobra pilots for that initially, but, uh, it was not intentional. It just seemed like the thing to do at the time. And, uh, and frankly, at 21, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> right. Now, you, you commanded the Aerial Scout Platoon, the out, known as the Outcast of, of, of D Troop. How did they get the name Outcast? D Troop was the Divisional Air Cavalry Troop of the 1st Squadron, 4th Cavalry of the 1st Infantry Division. When the division came to Vietnam in 1965, when the majority of the main force divisions deployed, um, the, the air troop had only B model helicopters. Uh, they had B model uh, troop carriers and they had B model gunships with the M16 gun system, the uh, twin 60s on each side with rocket pods. They did not have a scout component at all. Uh, it was not until about 19. Uh, 66, 67, that they determined that they needed a scout capability. And so uh, throughout Vietnam, they scrounged up uh, uh, helicopters from various units, OH-13s and their pilots, and merged them into these air cavalry troops. The B model guys had all come from Fort Riley together as a unit in 65. Their call signs were Mustangs for the gun pilots and rodeo clowns for the slick unit. The scout guys who were newly infused into the unit and did not come from Fort Riley considered themselves outcasts. Um, they weren't deployed with the, tr the troop from, uh, from Fort Riley. And so around a uh, beer session one night, the platoon commander said, we're nothing but a bunch of outcasts and uh, the name stuck uh, and lasted until the end of the war. Uh, the outcast flew in another organization when the first division came home, that Air Cav Troop stayed in country and rebadged as Charlie Troop 16th Cav with whom I also flew. Um, and, and so the outcast stayed until the war was actually over. And then you, um, later on you flew the AH-1G Cobra. In, in between my two scout tours, uh, I, I went back to Vietnam uh, in, uh, in September of 1971 as a Cobra pilot, and I flew with uh, D Troop 3rd uh, Squadron, 5th Cavalry of the 101st Airborne Division up in I Corps. And uh, when that unit stood down, I was offered the opportunity to come home, but I had uh, uh, no better place to be at that point in my career than, than combat. So I volunteered to remain in country for a third tour and went back to the Delta where C-16 was located and, uh, and flew scouts again. What well, I'm sure it was a, a different experience flying from the, um, from the OHs to the Cobra. The, the Cobra was the first aircraft designed uh, by the Army to be a gunship, a dedicated gunship. It was about 60 or 70 percent uh, parts commonality with the UH-1 Huey, but in a much uh, slimmer fuselage, 36 inches wide at the waist and, and the canopy bulge, the widest part of the aircraft was only 42 inches. Uh, very fast, 190 knots uh, of airspeed, uh, heavily armed, 
uh, 2.75 inch uh, folding fin aerial rockets would carry four pods. Uh, XM-18 gun system, the minigun located under the wings, and also the turret, which mounted a 40 millimeter grenade launcher and another minigun. So uh, Cobra was a, was a dedicated fire support aircraft for the Army. Uh, OH-6 was a brand new dedicated scout ship for the Army and both paired up together in the air cav troops of uh, the units in Vietnam. And they worked so wonderfully well together. I enjoyed Cobras, but my heart has always been in the scouts. I like the mission, I like the aircraft, uh, but I also like to have a guy with 76 rockets behind me in case I got in trouble. You know, I recently learned, I was doing a little bit of research and found that your, one of your original OH-6s is in a museum now. That's, that, yes, that's correct. 17340 uh, was the last OH-6 I flew in Vietnam in the uh, 16th Cavalry as Dark Horse 1-6 for the second time. And uh, when I went home, that aircraft uh, went to my assistant platoon leader, a lieutenant named Drew Sheely, uh, who's an emergency room doctor up in uh, Shinomish, Washington. Uh, interestingly, after the war, Drew got out and became a doctor. And when President Reagan was shot, Drew was the second attending physician in the emergency room for the president of the United States. But, <clears throat> excuse me, when... Drew was shot down in Vietnam. The aircraft was damaged. It went back to Culver City, California for a rebuild. And when it was finished, it, the war was essentially over. And so the aircraft went to uh, Fort Rucker and was number two, aircraft number two on the Army demonstration team from 73 to 75, the Silver Eagles. When that unit stood down amid the oil uh, embargo, um, the aircraft, because it had flown with the Silver Eagles and in Vietnam, was kept by the Army Aviation Museum. And then about 1993-94, it was completely restored into the colors that I flew it in in Vietnam. Uh, and it hangs from the uh, ceiling of the Army Aviation Museum at Fort Rucker. So its crew chief was, was Jimmy Christie of Sistersville, West Virginia. Jimmy... Uh, uh, passed away uh, four years ago, uh, and and I'm proud to say that on the day that I go, that airplane will still be there and still be maintained, and it will last longer than it, its crew uh, possibly could. Well, you know, I mentioned earlier you we, you have been generous to uh, loan us some items from when you were in Vietnam. We have your uniform, we have a hat that you wore, we have your uh, flight helmet and some other items. We always get questions though on your, on your flight helmet. Uh, it's, it's very colorful uh, part of it. And you have Captain America on one side. Of it. And we always get questions, which I really don't know the answer to. And that's why I'm talking with you. Is there, was there a particular reason you had Captain of America? Was he a hero of yours? Or, or what's the story behind him on your helmet? When, when I was flying with the D Troop 3rd of the 5th Cav as a, as a Cobra platoon commander, um, I had a young lieutenant named Ron Dibella, now deceased, who uh, was a bit rebellious, let's say. And uh, I had certain requirements of him that, that perhaps he was not 100% enamored of. And he started calling me Captain America. Um, I didn't drink. I've, I've never been a drinker. Um, and he did maybe more than he should, but the name stuck and that became my, if you will, call sign, uh, which has remained with me throughout my career. So on that particular helmet, there's a, there's a painting on the visor in great big gold letters that says war. What you don't see usually is on the side of the helmet, it says is hazardous to your health. And then on the other side, the uh, the right side of the the helmet, there's a Captain America figure, and that's a uh, uh, that's a testimony to Lieutenant Ron Dabella, who whose military career lasted about two years, and and uh, uh, he went off to be a free spirit after that. But uh, that's where it came from. Uh, the war was kind of in your face, but when you looked at the side, it said is hazardous to your health, which is 
not that in your face. And then uh, Captain America uh, is, is a uh, uh, moniker that kind of stayed with me throughout my career. One of the photographs we have of you, um, uh, I guess being uh, extracted, uh, you were, you were one of the times you were shot down, if you want to share with us how many times you were shot down. But it's a, it's an interesting photograph with you coming up in a basket and you got your, your weapon across you and you're in that helmet uh, that we have on display. Yeah, that's correct. Um, the, uh, the, the date was 30 January of uh, 72. Um, I was uh, out near uh, a place called the Rung Rung Valley in i Corps, and we were uh, summoned by an Air Force FAC forward air controller who had an anti-aircraft pit located and he didn't have any fast movers to put on it. And he asked if there were any army gunships in the area. Um, I answered up on guard and, and was vectored into his location. He identified the area for me. I was at about 5,000 feet with uh, Bob Smith, who was my wingman. And uh, I rolled in to attack the, uh, the gun position. And uh, my first, uh, uh, my first burst was 20 millimeter Vulcan off my left wing as a M35 system on the Cobra. Uh, and then I switched in the dive, I switched to flechettes, which were on my right inboard pod. And I fired one flechette. The second flechette ignited, but did not leave the tube in a phenomena that we called a hang fire. So all of a sudden I had a jet assist on my right wing and nothing on the left wing, and, and it was severely, severely yaw in the airplane. Uh, that sequence of events took about three seconds. It blew off the 60-degree uh, uh, gearbox, 42-degree gearbox, and 90-degree gearbox, which took the tail of the airplane. We ultimately crashed. Um, a testament to the aircraft is that uh, my co-pilot and I were not killed, but we were seriously injured. Um, the fuel cell popped out the side of the airplane, which is the only reason we survived. Uh, and then ultimately over a period of time, uh, I was uh, rescued by the 37th Aero Rescue Squadron of the U.S. Air Force of Jolly Green, dropped a paramedic, a para-jumper um, named Harvey Picklesimer. Harvey's uh, passed on now too, but unfortunate name for a really terrific guy. And and uh, uh, I was, I was uh, put in the basket and brought up after John Bryant, my co-pilot, was uh, extracted. He was, uh, he was severely, severely injured. Well, it's a very moving picture, and, and I'm glad we have it in our collection. You uh, are, also, are also an author. Uh, you, you wrote a book, Low Level Hell, A Scout Pilot in the Big Red One, about your experiences in Vietnam. I believe it was 92. It came out in 93, right? We That's sell correct. it for those who are interested and do not have a copy. We do sell it here at the museum where you can get it online. It's an excellent book. I uh, highly recommend it. Or recommend it. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how it was writing that? Did you, you know, I'm sure you uh, had some memories that you had to go back and, and get and put into that about your experiences. I, I started writing that in... Uh, in 1970, um, I, I came home from Vietnam in, in uh, essentially December of 69 and in, uh, in uh, 70, uh, I married my high school uh, sweetheart, Margaret uh, Wilson from Hot Springs. And um, seven months later, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and ultimately would die in February of, of 71 at uh, Fort Sam. So as a catharsis for me at the time, I just I had a lot of free time and, and a lot on my mind. And so I just started writing using the diaries that I'd kept when I was in Vietnam. And I went off and, and uh, decided to go back to Vietnam again. So that, that kind of put all of that... Uh, uh, in the storage locker for a while. And I came back in, in 1990 and picked up all those notes and started again um, and, and finished the, the book, which essentially talks about my experience from 
January 69 to December 69 with the 1st Infantry Division. And I have been just blown away at the, at the reception. Uh, nothing but good reviews and, and uh, especially from guys that were there. And that's really the audience I wrote it for was uh, uh, the guys that were there. The scouts were a, uh, an essentially lesser known a group of guys. There weren't that many of us. And, and frankly, the attrition rate was just horrendous. Uh, 80% of my guys were casualties in 69 and 68% uh, of my guys were casualties in 1972 in scouts. So uh, it was great for me. I've enjoyed it. It's a hundred percent real people. There are no fictional events are people in, the, in that book. And I think that's what keeps an author focused and on the right path is, uh, is, is you, you keep it real. Uh, if you take anonymous turns and, and that sort of thing, I think you get a little judicial uh, or literary license to, to change the facts. And I chose not to do that. So all those people who lived and died in that book are, are real people and their family, uh, uh, follows behind, behind them. It's certainly, a, a, like you said, it's, it's an impactful book. It's a great book. And anyone who is interested or wants to know what it was like for a pilot back then, they certainly need to read it. Um, also, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, I kind of want to go to a, a, a lighter note. Uh, you talked about growing that you had grown up some in Monticello before moving to Hot Springs. Now, could you tell us a little bit of story about something you lost in 1957 in Monticello, but sort of <laughs> made its way back to you a number of years later? Yeah, and this is, uh, if, if you don't believe in irony, uh, then there's something wrong with you. Um, I grew up in, in Monticello. I went to W.C. Whaley Elementary School. My dad was superintendent of schools uh, there in Monticello. And uh, my, my best friend in those days was David Marsh, who's, uh, whose family owned the Ben Franklin store on the square in Monticello. And David and I were huge uh, uh, fans of, of playing Army. And his dad was a veteran of, of uh, World War II and had all kinds of military stuff in the house. And so we uh, routinely would be found terrorizing the neighborhood and attacking German forces throughout Monticello. But um, uh, if you fast forward to just a couple of years ago, I was sitting at home and the phone rang and, and this gentleman said, are you Hugh Mills? And I said, yes. And and then he said, did you serve in World War II? And I said, well, no, not, not quite. I'm not quite that old, but my dad did. It, it turns out that this is the police chief in Monticello, Arkansas, who is an amateur uh, metal detector. And the chief had been out on the uh, playground of the old W.C. Whaley Elementary School, now torn down, metal detecting. And he detected something, dug it up, and it was my father's World War II uh, Army dog tag. So it is, it is obvious to me that I was playing on that playground, probably wearing his dog tags and lost it. And then uh, 40, 50 years later, the chief of police in Monticello digs it up, and I have it back. He was kind enough to send it to me. I'm sure that's something important that you you cherish since it belonged to your father. Yeah, my dad was uh, was in the medical administrative corps in World War II. He never left the United States. Um, he uh, was at uh, uh, military hospitals in the Presidio and in uh, Texas and uh, in uh, Crowell Army Hospital in Cleveland. But as, as dad would say, uh, almost uh, to uh, the time of his death, not one Japanese soldier got past him in Cleveland. So uh, he's, he's proud of that service. And, and uh, uh, I was very proud. He was also an OCS graduate. Uh, he's from Marshall in uh, Searcy County. And my mother from Paragould in Greene County. And uh, dad uh, was, was, was promoted to second lieutenant in uh, OCS and then served at Crowell Hospital until the war ended. 
Well, could, as we wrap this up, could you just tell us a little bit about what you're doing now, where you're at, uh, any projects you've got going? I uh, stayed in the Army for, uh, for 26 years. Uh, I retired. I came to Kansas City. I was in Kansas City when I retired. Um, I flew helicopters for the Kansas City Police Department for 15 years. Um, I went off to be the under sheriff of Jackson County here in Kansas City for 10 years. And uh, currently I'm the chief of the transit security and safety for the transportation authority uh, for Kansas and Missouri on, on this end of the, uh, of the state of Missouri. Um, I am working on a, uh, on a project right now with some folks in, in Hollywood. We, uh, we went to Vietnam uh, two years ago and I ha had an opportunity to meet the actual guys I was shooting at on that event that we discussed earlier. Um, we lost an aircraft on the 31st of December, 71, uh, shot down, lost another one on the uh, uh, 25th of January, 1972, and then my aircraft. So in the course of less than 30 days, we had lost three aircraft to one particular unit, which was the uh, seventh, uh, uh, the 10th Company, 7th Battalion, 241st NVA Anti-Aircraft Regiment. And in writing the sequel to Low Level Hell, I happened to come across um, an address of a friend of mine named Merle Pibbenow. And Merle is a, is a very well-known author and uh, translator of Vietnamese documents for the CIA. And I call Merle and I said, Merle, I'm working on this uh, uh, battle that I was involved in, in in January of 72. Is there any way to know the unit that, that uh, I was flying against? And he said, let me get back to you. And about two days later, he called me, gave me the information, 7th, Country, uh, 7th Company, 10th Battalion, 241st NVA, and the guy that shot your helicopter down was named Pham Nok An. And I said, how in the world do you know that? And his response was, well, I translated their unit history for the CIA. And I've got the files and I'm going to send them to you. I gave that to a friend of mine who's a producer in, in Hollywood named John Bruno who's an Academy Award winner for things like True Lies and Ghostbusters and uh, movies like that, a high powered guy. And he set up a trip and we went to Vietnam and I met with the 17 surviving members of the 241st NVA Regiment. And I spent three weeks with them. Um, we went to Ho Chi Minh's former uh, uh, encampment up by the Chinese border uh, I went to General Jap's grave. Uh, I got on a bus with those guys and went back to Quezon, where all of this event took place, uh, and actually walked the ground with them um, and discussed directly with the individuals who participated what their viewpoint was, what my viewpoint was, what they saw, what I saw. We lost a number of men uh, in that engagement, two of whom have never been recovered. Their bodies were consumed in a fire. Uh, others died after the fact, but they lost about 40 and their guys are buried right there at the uh, military cemetery at Quezon, the NVA cemetery. And, you know, the amazing thing to me was there was not one moment's acrimony. There was not one moment's hatred or, or uh, uh, negative uh, response to me or my wife. Uh, they were terrific. You know, the thing they wanted to know from day one, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm this age. I was 24 then. That's what they wanted to know. And all of them were about 18 when they came into the theater. And the Orientals, especially the Vietnamese, revere age. And the position of uncle in the family is, is a revered position. And they started calling me Uncle Hugh, which Vietnamese can't pronounce. And so they called me Uncle Ho for three weeks. They're very uncomfortable for, for an army guy uh, to be called Uncle Ho, but they were terrific fellows. I took a group picture with them at the site of the crash of Charlie Horse uh, 
uh, 2-5, and uh, in uniform, which the communist minders of that trip did not allow me to do, but I didn't pay any attention, did it anyway. Um, and it's a great picture. It's a terrific uh, keepsake for me. Um, but uh, we have just gotten, in the last two weeks, we've just gotten financial support from an organization that I won't mention yet, but it's a big one. Uh, and they have uh, taken all three weeks of our recordings and they're translating those into a documentary film that will be uh, released in some format in the next uh, year or two. Well, we certainly and look forward to that. I told you who it was, you'd, you'd recognize immediately uh, the movies that that group has done, but... Uh, well, we're um, certainly looking forward to that. Um, me too. I, I want to go back to Vietnam. I, I did make the one trip. Uh, I've got more I want to do. I'd like to go to the South a little bit more. Um, but I will certainly keep the museum posted on the progress of that. And uh, Please do. We, we would certainly love, you know, after the pandemic is over, we, we will resume, hopefully, our movies at MacArthur. We, we show historical documentaries uh, we've been doing, and this is something that would be great for the museum. Thank you so well, let much. Me, let me say before, before we get away from it, I, I really support what you guys are doing there with the museum. I was extremely uh, honored to be asked to come down and, and witness when Wesley Clark did a book signing in the museum. And I had served uh, to some degree under General Clark in another theater at another time and was happy to meet with him and, and to renew that acquaintanceship. And, uh, what you're doing is so, so important for the young people of Arkansas and anything I can do to help the museum, you have uh, only to ask. Well, thank you very much. And we do certainly appreciate you, your service and your friendship to the museum. And, and uh, I was so excited to finally get to meet you and talk with you in person. I've read a lot about you, researched a lot about you, but it's nothing like um, meeting you in person, well, over Zoom. So uh, thank you for that. And um, I'm gonna sign off us right now, and, uh, but hopefully you'll stay on for just a minute. And we'll talk a little bit, but for everyone, thank you for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed this interview with Colonel Mills, um, a, a true patriot and true uh, friend of Arkansas and, and this museum. So thank you so much for joining. My pleasure.